Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Save yourself, man! Well, despite tonight's vote rejecting the no deal scenario, ministers are continuing to prepare for the possibility of a no deal Brexit. The government has set out which tariffs or taxes would apply to goods imported to the UK in the event of no deal. The proposals have been widely criticised by business leaders and by farming groups. In a moment, we'll be hearing what it means for Northern Ireland from our correspondent Emma Vardy. But first, here's our business editor, Simon Jack. When it comes to world trade, the UK is a member of a club. Club EU allows members to trade freely with each other. Non-members have to pay for entry. They're charged agreed tariffs on many of the goods they bring in. If we leave the club without any agreement, we can charge whatever we want, but we have to make sure everyone in the world pays the same. Today, the government set out what those charges would be. At the moment, we as members slap additional charges on a range of non-EU imports, including oranges, jam, carpets and TVs. The government said it will reduce all of those to zero. And that will make those foreign imports cheaper, potentially driving down prices. But some industries are worried that foreign competition could damage domestic producers, particularly in agriculture. So, so the government said it will keep the same charges on lamb imports to protect sheep farmers. It will also charge tariffs on beef. That could hurt Irish farmers who export to the UK. And remember, UK farmers will have to pay to export into the EU. Even those sectors like beef that you touch on where we will have some protection, uh, that won't help us at all in terms of our exports. Uh, and We don't yet know what on earth will happen in terms of export tariffs. Uh, and for me, that's why uh, no deal is still catastrophic for the farming sector. Now remember, you have to apply the same rules to everyone. So some things we used to get tariff-free from the EU will get more expensive, like cars. Now, 70% of all the cars bought in the UK last year were imported from the EU. If we leave with no deal, a new tariff charge of 10% would be added to the price. That's an average of around £1,500 per car. Cars being exported from the UK to Europe will face a tariff of over 10% when they land in Europe. That's a big negative shock for the UK car industry. If the government was to unilaterally cut tariffs on imports, that would be a very uneven playing field and it would mean an even bigger shock for the UK car industry. So they'll want to keep some degree of protection. But let's be clear, this will make cars in the UK more expensive and consumers will lose out. This is just what the UK is charging. The EU will have to charge the UK the same as it charges all other non-members, making UK exports more expensive for EU customers. Now, that means more products could stay in the UK, pushing prices down, which could be good for consumers, but bad for producers. This new regime will run for a year's experiment, and only if there is no deal, something businesses and most of Parliament still hope will never happen. But if it does... What will happen in Northern Ireland? Farmers in Northern Ireland were told today if there's no deal, goods from the Irish Republic will be able to travel into Northern Ireland duty free. But Northern Irish producers may have to face full EU charges going the other way. It would keep an open Irish border with no checks or controls, but that's too one-sided, they say. There's uh, something like 400,000 lambs from Northern Ireland who uh, travel south every year. You know, we'll face a full tariff of 35 to 40 pounds sterling per lamb, which is, isn't sustainable in the sheep industry. You know, we just couldn't handle that sort of tariff. So it is very disappointing that we've been treated as farmers in this way. There are also warnings that the special arrangements for the Irish border could be exploited if Irish producers decided to reroute their goods through Northern Ireland to be sold on elsewhere to save a few quid on tariffs. Quite quickly you will see goods from Ireland being redirected north and within a couple of weeks goods from the whole of Europe seeking to avoid the tariffs for the rest of the UK will wash through Northern Ireland. Not so fast, says the government, there will be intelligence to catch smugglers out. But keeping the border open isn't without risk. Emma Vardy, BBC News.
Well, tonight's vote by MPs to rule out a no-deal Brexit pushed the pound up to its highest level against the euro for nearly two years. It might be off the agenda now, but before the voting, the government made sure MPs and the rest of us, for that matter, know what kind of trade tariffs they would impose if there ever was a no-deal Brexit. And remember, as the Prime Minister said, for now, that remains the default in law. The government claims that the percentage of imports from around the world that are subject to tariffs would actually fall from 87 to 80. But that would involve big increases in the cost of imported cars and some food. But here is where it gets, frankly, a bit bizarre. There would, in some, be tariffs and checks on goods entering the UK, but not if they came in from the Republic of Ireland to Northern Ireland. A smuggler's charter, some were calling that. At Port of Dover, up to 10,000 lorries a day roll into the UK, carrying goods from all over the EU. As it stands, those goods arrive tariff-free, but that could change. The prospect of no deal tonight looks remote, but it is still a possibility. And today the government revealed the taxes it plans to impose on foreign imports if no deal happens. The government would impose a tariff of 10% on all cars from the EU. The tax is designed to protect car makers in Britain from competition. This company in Shropshire is delighted. It supplies Jaguar, Land Rover and Nissan. This is a step, a positive step, which means we can protect jobs in this country. It's good news. But car makers don't see it that way. Ford told ITV News the government's tariffs are draconian and would be a devastating blow to the viability of its British factories. The reason? The 10% tariff on imports of cars from the EU would push up the retail price of the average car in Britain by £1,500. As well as cars, the government would levy tariffs on many foods to protect British farmers. The price of beef, pork, lamb, butter and some cheeses in the shops would rise. But most imports would be tariff-free, including wine, onions, peas and televisions. The government's no-deal trade plans have been drawn up in secret over the last two and a half years. Is it acceptable that businesses are only finding this information out 16 days before Brexit? I think it's pretty farcical. Quite frankly, uh, the time to have that discussion was a long time ago. The minute that the, the Prime Minister announced that no deal was better than a bad deal, you should have had a public consultation about uh, what kind of uh, tariff reductions or changes you wanted to make. But here's the remarkable thing. In the event of no deal, there would be no customs checks on the Irish border and therefore no tariffs on any goods moving from Ireland into Northern Ireland. There would be, in effect, a potential back door into Britain through which smugglers could operate. I find it quite ridiculous, but I find it very worrying as well because when you talk about the honesty box, you're depending on people, individuals who are involved in serious criminal uh, uh, organisations to turn around uh, tomorrow and say, look, at, we will be part of something that is uh, truthful and honest. The government plays down the risk of smuggling, but in the past, contraband goods like this impounded diesel have helped fund terrorist organisations. Many of those who voted against the backstop uh, did so on the basis that they feared that Northern Ireland may be treated differently uh, in a few years' time. Uh, the UK proposals and the UK government proposals will treat Northern Ireland differently. The government says its tariff plans would help limit the economic damage a no-deal Brexit would cause. And tonight, no deal remains the default legal position. It could still happen. John Hills, News at 10. Amid the drama of Parliament, it can be easy to forget what the public make of all of this. Katie Razzell has been to South Wales to ask voters there how they're feeling now. Steve's Fish Bar has been a Port Tolba institution for nearly 35 years. He and his wife Sunthorn have built up a successful and well-supported enterprise. The opposite, he feels, of what's happened in Westminster. The unprepared probably, it's just uh, last minute. And uh, no, it's a bit of a shambles. Yeah. The chippy sits beneath the chimneys of the UK's largest steelworks. The town's economy is tied to Britain's post-Brexit fortunes. The UK's car industry still gets its steel from here, and this is still a Labour heartland but decades of decline helped fuel the resounding Brexit vote in this part of Wales. Labour voters in towns like Port Talbot were a key part of the Leave coalition. But with plans to leave the EU apparently derailed in Westminster, what do people here think of Brexit's future? Oh, I'd say it was definitely dead, yeah. There's uh, no chance that it's ever going to happen, you know, the way we anticipated. So you're telling me it's dead. How angry are you about that? Well, I'm angry. I can bang me fist up and down on the counter 
But what difference is it going to make? There's just no common sense at the end of the day, is there, you know? The money they must have spent going back and forth, having these uh, meetings and what have you, you know? And where has it got us? Nowhere. We back to square one. Who do you blame for, you know, Brexit not necessarily being delivered? Um, well, I think Theresa May always wanted to stay, so I don't think she's done a particularly good job. Absolutely no time at all for Jerry Gene Corbyn. Scottish Nationals, no time for them. Anyone, basically, who was trying to slow it down or stop it. 35 miles along the coast is Tory-held Vale of Glamorgan. It's Wales's bellwether seat. For 40 years, the MP elected here has come from the same party that has won the general election. Thanks so much. Tea for Thank you. Yes, please. In Benny's Cafe, we meet two Barry councillors. How worried are these local Conservatives that the Brexit they fought for is being taken off the menu? I go door knocking and people say to me, you know, what's happening? You know, this is not what we've asked for. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, it's dead. Where we go from here? Well, if the, if the betrayal hasn't yet happened, then it's underway, is how it feels. If you go back to the referendum, and we both knocked doors during the campaign, if you, a lot of people felt like, you know, this was a chance to to kick back a, a distant, detached elite in Brussels. And the MPs that we've got in Westminster at the moment, on the whole, seem to be doing a good impression of replicating that distant elite. But it's, it's your the, MPs, it's your, you know, hard Brexit MPs who have stopped it getting through. I don't accept that. I'm not sure that Theresa May's deal, I don't think that in, in any measure Theresa May's deal qualifies as the Brexit that we voted for. With that in mind, they think the best hope of reclaiming Brexit may be to hold a general election. It might be that that is now the only way that we can rescue a clean Brexit from the jaws of uh, a second referendum. On Swansea Bay, it feels a world away from the endless votes and all the political drama of Westminster. But the turmoil over Brexit is still the main talking point for the walkers on the beach. The leavers we've spoken to fear that Brexit might be killed off by this parliament. Does that put a spring in the step of Remainers? Up until about six months ago, I was sort of crying out for a general election, but now I, I think uh, if there was a general election, I really wouldn't know who to vote for. And what do you think about the idea of a second referendum? Uh, I'd love a second referendum. I'd be absolutely, I think it's the right thing to do now. I think after this vote tonight, I think the, there'll be a lot more talk of it, I think. That would be anathema to many leavers here. There's anger that the Brexit they thought they voted for is in danger of being swept away. Katie Razzle in Wales for us there. We're going to take a quick look at tomorrow's front pages, first of all. The Times has a picture of a fairly sombre-looking Amber Rudd. Uh, Brexit meltdown is their headline. May's deal back from the dead. Chaos over legal advice. And then it's talking about these ministers who've defied the PM in a vote. Um, Amber Rudd was one of them, one of five cabinet ministers to defy the whip, which was, um, you know, as we've tried to explain, a rather confused whip, to say the least. The Daily Mail has got May loses control after ministers' mass revolt to rule out no deal. Now she wants a third vote on her deal. Chaos reigns. And the Daily Telegraph has got four of these um, cabinet rebels. They're calling Amber Rudd, David Gork, Greg Clark and David Mundell. They all abstained. They didn't vote against it, but they abstained in defiance of a three-line whip, um, which had complications uh, all of its own. Well, to chew over today's events in Westminster, I'm joined now by the author Lionel Shriver, Laura Hughes from the Financial Times, Tom Newton Dunn from the Sun's political editor, and the former director of communications at Downing Street, Alistair Campbell, who's now campaigning for a second referendum. I'm going to come to you two in a second. If I could just start with your sense of the day. What has changed today and what has stayed the same? I think we're both exhausted, to be honest. <laughs> so that's stayed the same. About the <laughs> that, that's, that hasn't changed at all. No, I mean, there's something interesting that my boss said on Twitter earlier, George Parker, which is that actually today it feels like perhaps the PM mm. is on course to victory through losing. She's losing her way to victory. And that tonight, from speaking to your sceptics, who I've been speaking to for a very long time, it did feel like a moment, and I actually do think she might get this deal through in the end because there are some very nervous Eurosceptic MPs tonight who have gradually softened, and then it really was a turning point this mo the mo um, when this extraordinary vote happened that they were texting me sort of mm. saying, I'm going to lose my seat. Do we do this the whole time? I mean, you know, I started yesterday morning thinking she was going to get it mm. through, and then you're down, and then you're up, and then you're down. I mean, yeah. do, why, do you feel the same? Do you think she's going to get it through third time lucky? I sus 
suspect not. I think it might be very, very close indeed. Uh, but I think the odds against her are still absolutely enormous. The, the reason why we do the yo-yo thing uh, up and down all the time is because we're in a hung parliament. You know, the, the mm. basic facts haven't really changed since June 2017. She has no majority. Uh, she can be held hostage by seven MPs going the wrong way. That's pretty much what happened again tonight. So hence the yo-yo. I think she'll get quite close next week. Uh, there is a very hard core of ERG members, hardline Tory Eurosceptics, uh, roughly 20 25, who will not vote for her no matter what. You heard Steve Baker say right. that earlier. And I'm I right. suspect then what we'll be into is no confidence votes by this time next week. No confidence, meaning the government itself could fall. I can see the ERG voting with Labour to bring down the government rather than allowing her to go back to Brussels and have a two-year extension, for example. That is Labour and the ERG on the same side. Yeah, because remember, you don't have an so immediate Labour's general now a election. Different uh, ERG is a different party in your mind now. I, I think it's been a different party for, for, for a while now. But remember, you know, their, their fundamental yes, baseline yes. is to stop this. I, I wonder, Lionel, whether you think the public is still being heard in this whole debate, whether if this went, I mean, you know, if this went to a public vote, most people would say, take the bloody deal and get on with it. Well, I think the public, uh, the leave public, is being marginalised. And um, it's partly uh, the, the way that's been done is to categorise actually wanting to leave the European Union as a right-wing position. I, I actually believe it is neither right nor left. But uh, it's now considered extremist to actually want to leave. In fact, well, this why whole, do you think that is? Um, well, there was a, an ingenious, um, concerted, uh, if you will, advertising campaign right after the re referendum, which came up with these coinages, uh, hard and soft Brexit, which we never heard before. But isn't it to do with the position before. of the ERG? I mean, you know, they, they are the right but, wing of the but, Conservative but, Party, aren't they? The, when people were voting in the referendum, there was no such thing as hard and soft Brexit. There was just Brexit. And therefore, you were actually going to leave. And then suddenly out sprouts this soft option, which wasn't on the ballot. Do we, do we know what the Brexit is that people want to see? And I, you know, don't just take this into a people's vote moment. Do you think we understand the Brexit that people want to see? This was a question the question. people. Think. Well, Danny Finkelstein raised you know, this question in his piece today in The Times. What, what does that Brexit look like? Do, do, do you well, have I think any the, idea? Pro the problem with the, the referendum is that Brexit could mean anything that anybody wanted it to mean. And that goes for the politicians who exploited that sentiment, Boris Johnson, Farage, etc., but also for the public. So Brexit, because it was actually a myth, it was a set of unicorns, it was a fantasy. And I think what this whole process has shown is the Brexit that was promised is undeliverable without doing damage to the country. And that's what the MPs, to be fair to them, that is what they've had to wrestle with ever since. What's really interesting, and I think we saw it with the Attorney General's um, legal ruling yesterday, was this sense of almost, dare I say, the spectre of Chilcot. People imagining what this would look like mm. in an inquiry in a decade's time. Do you think that well, is... Well, hopefully it'll be sooner than that. Well, I think, I think we'll have Chilcot wasn't, but, you know, the, the yeah. idea that people... Maybe there isn't any Cabinet responsibility. Maybe there isn't the Alistair Campbell whipping quite as forcefully as he could under Tony Blair. Maybe people are going their own individual ways because they really want to be... Yeah, I think, I think what happened yesterday was a little more simple than that, although I, I highly respect you, your attempt to, to make it a bigger thing. You had an attorney general who was a very proud, uh, eminent QC, worked on by some Brexiteers to embarrass, who behaved like a very proud QC rather than a politician. He came back with something he was completely unable, unwilling to sell, mm. which is what collapsed the whole government deal. It is, however, it is, it is put back together, boy. It's really interesting. We're reporting tomorrow, the Times report tomorrow, that the government have been talking to the DUP all day long in some secrecy in the Cabinet office. They tried to deny it was happening. It then turned out it certainly did. The DUP, it feels like to me, are aching to back a deal as are probably 20 or so more Tory MPs, they need the DUP as cover. So I think the, the PM can narrow down these, this horse race to these couple of binary options last week, which she's failed to do so spectacularly in the last few months, but it still will be very, very close. But the, other, the other thing that's going on here, please, and we, you know, I understand why there's all this focus on Parliament and we keep having these sort of vox box from here and there, but I do think most people, Remainers or Leavers, however they voted, are looking on at this and thinking this is so chaotic, this is so badly led, and it's so much is becoming about her, my deal. 
when actually I do think the national interest is being forgotten. And I don't actually believe the Leave voters are being marginalised. I think the voters in general are being marginalised from a debate where the MPs, and to be fair to those MPs you had earlier, I think they're all trying to do what they believe That's is the, the right thing. That's the interesting thing. thing. They, they are all trying to be their best understanding of what a good representative is, right? Yes, but there are very different understandings of, of what course. that is. And, and some think that, oh, you have to do the greater good of the country and defy your, your own constituents. And some think they have to do the, the bidding of their constituents. It's a very different understanding of representative democracy. But I think one of the things that's going wrong here, because I, I see many routes to uh, uh, either overturning the referendum or having a, such a soft Brexit, you might as well not have bothered. I, I think that uh, the problem with the uh, betrayal of the leave vote is that there are no consequences. I, I, read, I read continually uh, all these op-eds talking about... You think if Brexit didn't happen, no one would pay the price? No, there is a very small price to pay because, you know, all these op-eds talk about, oh, you know, the people are going to become embittered, they're going to lose faith in their politicians. Well, you know, they're already a little embittered and they never had a lot of faith in politicians to begin with. What's changed? Yeah, but it, they, always, they're they, not going to burn down John Lewis on Oxford Street. But, the, they, but they might do. They're they not might French. Do, they might do with no deal and they might do with the chaos that follows from that. And I think this is why I think this is a not, I don't agree with the people who say there's going to be all these millions of people rampaging around the streets if you give them another choice. Because actually, it's not as if you go into a different country and say, here, Germany, you decide. You say to the British people, yeah. on the basis of what you now know, do you still wish to proceed? That's but Lionel's saying something more, more to subtle do. than that, which is the people who are, are feeling hacked off enough with what they've got could be ignored even this time, and at that point, you've lost them forever. But it's their life yeah, that are being ignored Yeah, but it doesn't matter if you moment. lose them forever. I mean, it, 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 in other words, from a Remainer perspective, if you say, oh, you know, the Leave voters are going to become uh, disenchanted with politics and, and stop participating, well, isn't that great? You have all the little stupid no, people who so, don't vote that, anymore. That's so cynical. This is where I think it is the, cynical, the, but I think that, that well. there is an understanding uh, that is profoundly cynical on the Remain side, that they can do whatever they want for the good of the country, and there will be no real pr price to pay. What cyni I'll tell you what will breed cynicism. Theresa May bangs on the whole time about how profound, what damage we'll do to democracy if we put this back to the people. The damage that is being done to democracy right now by MPs doing things that they don't actually believe in, by policy, leaders saying things that they don't believe in, and also by literally taking the country to a cliff edge based upon the fact that I'm going to do everything I have to do to get my deal. This is where I think the argument of indicative votes comes in, because I think the Prime Minister, whilst I completely understand why she wouldn't want to do it, because she risks splitting the Conservative Party and going hand in hand with Jeremy Corbyn to get this deal through. I think if she were to put it to Parliament and give MPs a chance to indicate what majority there is in Parliament for a Brexit deal. I think that's a fair thing for the Prime Minister to do. Is that a fear, Tom? What, what do you think? Why she is won't she do doing it. that? She won't do it. Uh, well, largely because she'll lose control. Uh, she hates the idea of she's addictive will lose control. She, She's a control lost freak. Control. She is the Prime Minister. <laughs> you, you give someone else a say, there's a very good chance they'll, they'll take it. So this is why, for her, it's always been Route 1. It's always been the meaningful vote from, from, from the get-go. Okay. It isn't going to change. They will drag her from the dispatch box. But it box could serve to her, her advantage if Parliament were to come out in favour of a Norway-style deal. She could then use that as leverage to the DUP and and say, look, it's my deal, no deal, extending Article 50 for two years or a Norway-style option. Good news is it's only Wednesday. We have two more <laughs> days to go. Thank you all very much indeed. That brings us to the end of yet another pretty tumultuous day in Westminster. We'll be back again tomorrow, yet another round of voting then. Hopefully um, we'll get some sleep tonight. Good night. Happy.